All right, so let's continue uh, with our discussion about fluid dynamics. Um, I'm going to do a uh, derivation today. It's just one problem. Um, one derivation that I think you need to see because I think this really demonstrates a lot of the principles that I'm talking about. Kind of starts to bring a lot of things together. Uh, and this is a, a derivation of something called Bernoulli's principle. So you've probably heard of Bernoulli's principle at some point. Uh, Bernoulli's principle is talking about the relationship between a, a fluid's pressure and its velocity. Uh, in short, what Bernoulli theorized is that as the velocity of a fluid through some pipe or something increases, the pressure it exerts must decrease. And so what I'm going to show you is one way to derive that. And so what I've set up here is what's called a Bernoulli tube. So imagine you have some tube of arbitrary dimensions. It has some constriction in the middle and you move some fluid through it. I don't know, air or water, it doesn't matter. Some fluid. You can think of this like a play with a garden hose and squeeze it in the middle, setting up that kind of thing. And here's our direction of flow. And what we're going to do is we're going to put the piston on one side of this thing. And we're going to apply some force and we're going to compress this fluid. We're going to compress the piston by some distance delta x. So where do we start? Well, we need a couple of equations, right, if we're going to describe this. So the first thing, since we're talking about fluids, fluid pressures and fluid dynamics, we probably need to know something about pressures, right? So if we remember that pressure is force per area, it can also be force per volume, doesn't really matter. Uh, we're gonna use force per volume for this thing. Because we've got three dimensions, right? So that's our pressure. We also know we're going to use some very basic principles here. Since we're talking about motion, since we're talking about something in motion, the fluid in this case, we are talking about energy. And since what we're trying to do is show the relationship between pressure and velocity, we need some kind of equation that's gonna tie these things together. So we know that we're gonna need some energy equations, right? So we know that we're gonna need probably our kinetic energy equation. There's our one half mv squared. And we're probably going to need potential. So let's just say our potential in this case is mgh. We also know from our previous discussion of work and energy, we have the work energy theorem that says work is the negative of change in energy. We know that work is force times distance times cosine of the angle between the applied force and the distance traveling over. And we know, remember the negative sign, we know that our delta E is our Ke, which is one half mv squared minus mgh, or another way, it's the sum of the energies, right? So, this is all we know. So we need to come up with some way to connect these two equations 
and get something meaningful out of it. In other words, the way that you might hear this described in a task or a homework problem would be give me an expression for the velocity of the fluid at some point in terms of pressure and density. So these are things that we're going to need, right? So how are we going to get there? Well, we can take a look at our diagram and we can make a couple of assumptions. We're going to first of all assume that we're applying the force at basically perpendicular to this surface area piston. So we don't need to worry about a cosine theta term in there. That's going to go to one. So we've got something that looks like force times distance. We don't know anything about this force. And we don't really care. What we need is an expression of pressure. In fact, let's go ahead and we do force per unit area pressure there. And it will become obvious why I'm doing that in a second. So if pressure is force per unit area, then force algebraically must be pressure times area, right? Just basic algebra. So that means that our equation over here, our force is just pressure times area. The distance is this delta x. So we're just going to call that x. Over here, we have our one half term, the mass of the fluid, square root of the velocity of the fluid, and our potential. We'll just carry the negative through there. So not a big deal. You might be tempted at this point to simply rearrange and get an expression for V. That would be okay, but there's something else we can do. Because remember, I said that I want this in terms of pressure and density. So we need to know something about the density of the fluid. I don't know what this fluid is. It could be water, it could be hydraulic fluid, it could be great jelly, I don't know. But what I do know is that if it is a fluid, it in fact has mass, then it must have density, right? So there's gotta be a way to get there. This is where we have to get clever and understand something about mathematics and physics. So, we're comfortable where we got this, right? We just converted force to a different expression, pressure times area, that's fine. So whatever pressure comes out on this side, it's gonna be our P1. Remember we did the hydraulic uh, lift problem the other day. Take a look at this term, this A times X. This is not immediately clear, maybe right now. This is a profound thing. What is area? Areas, the, the dimensions of area are just length times width, right? So arbitrarily, we can say that our area looks like x squared. And we have x squared times x. Well, that means that we can just say that's x cubed, right? Basic algebra, multiply exponents or multiply variables, add the exponents. So we get p is something in terms of x cubed. What's x cubed? If x squared is area, then x cubed is volume, right? So what we can say is that this looks like P1 V1. 
Now, what volume are we talking about? We're talking about the volume of fluid that is displaced in this uh, movement of this piston. So we have P1, V1 equals negative one half V squared minus MGH. Remember this V squared is a velocity and this is a volume. We can just put subscripts on this. So what's H? H is some arbitrary height, right? It is some distance that we have the fluid pressing down on us. So H can be somewhere contained within this tube. Again, completely arbitrary. So we have this equation. What can we do with this? Remember, we still need something in terms of density. Density in this case is there. It's in this equation. You just don't know it yet. We need to do another math trick, similar to what we did with this AX. In other words, area times distance, this is a volume. We know we want something in terms of P, right? Not PV. So let's divide both sides through by V, and see what we get. All right, well, that V goes away. But look what we have here, something interesting comes out. We have a mass per unit volume term. What's mass per unit volume? Density. Density is mass per unit volume. So I can rewrite this whole thing as something that looks like P equals negative one half rho V1 squared, right? I'm just replacing mass per volume with rho, the density. Minus, well, I don't have an M anymore, but I do have a rho, GH. Now what can I do? I can take this whole thing and I can move everything to one side of the equation and it leaves that to be zero, right? Just algebra. What happens if I do this to the other side? What happens if I have another piston and it has some arbitrary area A2? It's got to move, right? It's going to move some distance. We can do the exact same thing, except subscript ones everywhere. So this is interesting. So if we do that, notice we're on the other side of the piston. So our directions have reversed. So you'll get negatives everywhere. Well, that's also got to be zero. So what we'll find is that our, we'll get an equation that looks like this.
we get an equation that looks like this. Effectively, all of the energies on one side of this piston, we just make some arbitrary dividing line here. All of the areas on one side of this piston have got to be equal to all of the energies on the other side. This is a closed system, right? We're not accounting for energy loss due to heat, friction, and you know, that kind of thing. What does this mean? It's, it's okay on a test or something if you were to just do this derivation. That's only a small part of the story. Now you have a bunch of symbols. But what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that since the energy is conserved, if this represents the total energy in the system, the fluid pressure, so we call that P1, plus what's called the kinetic pressure, plus the static pressure in the fluid. That is all of the energy that's there. Pascal's principle tells us that's got to be equal throughout the system. Well, if that energy is the same as this energy on this side, then what we can say is there's really no difference in those subscripts. So what we get is something that looks like fluid pressure plus kinetic uh, fluid energy plus the potential fluid energy is a constant, no matter what. So what does that mean? Who cares? Now's where I'm going to do a magic trick. So keep this in mind. This is Bernoulli's equation. This is one form of Bernoulli's equation, I should say. There's a much more complex derivation that's more complete, but for what I want to do for this class, this is fine. So here's my Bernoulli's equation. We know this value has got to be a constant. And let's go back to this diagram. Now I'm going to do something. Let's say that I'm somewhat of an engineer. I'm a design engineer, and I want this to look pretty. Well, what I'm interested in is what's happening inside this tube. So I don't really care what the outside of the tube looks like. So I could just fill that in, right? Just put a plate over that and make it look cool. So now let's start talking about what we're interested in. The only thing that's different here is this region where we have a constriction. That's really the piece we're interested in, is where we have this constriction. Something's got to change, right? The system has changed in some way. So that's what we're really interested in. Now, notice when I did this derivation, I'm only really interested in pressures and densities. I'm not really worried about how much this is compressed. I'm not worried about this height. So really, it doesn't matter how long this entry piece of this tube is. I'm really only interested up to the point where it starts this compression. So I can get rid of that. I really don't care what's happening after it passes the constriction. I've already made my measurement. The air, the fluid does what it does, it's gone. So anything after the compression, 
or the constriction. I really don't care. I also arbitrarily said, I constrict this in some way. The only thing I changed was delta H, right? I didn't tell you how big this was to start, just that there's a constriction. Well, if I don't care how big it is, I only care about one side of the constriction, right? Depending on which way my up and down. So I really don't need this piece. What is this? This is an interesting shape. A little more familiar. That's an airplane wing. It's got an airfoil. So this is why airplanes fly. So let's talk about it from a physics perspective using Bernoulli's principle. What's going on? Remember this. This value has to be a constant everywhere in the fluid. So let's take a look at the static pressure of the air around this airfoil. The static air pressure around that airfoil is going to be the same. It doesn't really matter, right? If I took this pen and somehow suspended it in the air, and I measured the atmospheric pressure pressing on this pin here and on the bottom and on the back, it would be the same. So we know this P has to be a constant, this P1 value or just P. That has to be a constant. One half is a constant and can't do anything about that. The density of the fluid is not going to change. So this thing goes through the air. The air itself does not change in any significant way. Yes, you can talk about compression waves, bleeding edge of the airfoil if you want. That's an advanced aerodynamics course. But for what I'm trying to talk about here, it's irrelevant. The density of the fluid is relatively constant. That, by the way, is a caveat to Bernoulli's principle that you must have a constant density fluid. If you have something that is non-uniform density, then this becomes nasty. You can do it, but it becomes gross. So we're gonna stick with constant density. Our acceleration due to gravity does not change. Right? The acceleration due to gravity is gonna be 9.81 meters per second squared, regardless of where you are. H1, what H are we talking about? Really what we're talking about is this, kind of the height of this constriction. We call that the camber of the wing. We can't really change that. Except what we can, and I'll talk about that in a second. For the most part, this is a constant. So if we go to Bernoulli's principle, and let's just label everything that's constant. That's a constant. That's a constant. That's a constant. That's the same constant. That's a constant. That's a constant. The only thing we're left with that's not a constant is velocity. Hmm. So think about it in terms of energy. What happens if I increase the velocity? If I increase the velocity of the airflow, over this surface, 
something's got to change, right? Because whatever value this equation has, it's got to be a constant. If I change the velocity, let's look at what can change. If I change the velocity, let's say, let's take your car and we're driving down the highway at 70, 80 miles an hour. If I change from 70 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour, does it change the mass of my car? No. It does a little bit, but it doesn't matter until you start approaching light speed. That's a relativity thing that you'll talk about in physics three. For our purposes, the mass remains constant. The volume of the car remains constant. So the density must remain constant. So no matter how fast we go, we're not changing the density of the air. We're not changing the value of a half. We're not changing the height of the airport. And we're certainly not changing the acceleration due to gravity. So the only thing that can change is this static pressure. So that means the faster the air moves, uh, let's see. So let's say V or velocity increases, then that means our pressure has to decrease. This is relative to what's going on on the bottom of this airport. So now we have a situation where we have a low pressure area on the top and a high pressure area on the bottom. What do we know about conservation of energy and systems? Energy always wants to go from the high to the low. Things want to move from the high pressure area to the low pressure area. This is why toothpaste tubes work. When you squeeze the tube, you're making a higher pressure. Toothpaste comes out because the pressure inside the tube is higher than pressure outside the tube. So the same thing happens here. We have a low pressure area up top. We have a relatively high pressure area on the bottom. And what results? Energy wants to move. Anytime energy is moving, create a force. So we have a force that's pushing up on this wing. Or another way to say it is it's lifting the wing. And we call that force lift. So the lift is a force. It is a function of how fast the air is moving over the surface of the wing. I'll show you the equation for lift. I don't expect you to know this, but it's interesting nonetheless. The equation for lift looks like this. The density of the air times the velocity over the wing times the surface area of the wing times what some call the coefficient of lift. Uh, it's an engineering term. Usually we describe this experimentally. It has to do with things like surface drag of the air going over the surface. We're not going to worry too much about it, just that it's a value, it's a constant that we have put in there, and then it divided by two. So what are we seeing? Well, what is this? Rho v squared over two. That looks like our kinetic energy piece, which is the only piece we really care about. And it's modified by the characteristics of the airfoil and the area of the airfoil. So in order to create lift, 
we can increase our velocity, thus changing this pressure differential. So let's see how we use this. So let's say that I have some airplane. Try to draw an airplane here. Pointing in forward, greasy side down, as airplanes tend to like to fly. Now we know this airplane has some mass, right? Therefore, it has some weight. Now we know by increasing the velocity over the airfoil that we create a pressure differential. And because of the shape of the airfoil, the pressure differential generates a lifting force. So what we can do is we want to find out how fast we need to go in order to get this airplane off the ground. In other words, at what point does the weight equal the lifting force? Well, if weight is mg, mass times acceleration due to gravity, the lifting force is rho v squared a c sub l over two. Let's think about this. If I know the weight of the aircraft, which I should, right? Um, the C5 Galaxy that I was the engineer on, we had a maximum gross takeoff weight of uh, about 800,000 pounds. And that was with safety margins built in. When they did flight testing on the airplane, they flew in at over a million pounds gross weight. So big, big, heavy airplane. So how are you going to lift? 800,000 pounds. That's what we're trying to find out, right? So we know its mass and we know the acceleration of gravity. Like I said, it works out to be about 800,000 pounds. You can convert that into Newtons if you like. Then we have density. So what is density? It's the density of the air around us. This is going to change with temperature. I don't think I'm going to have time to get to thermo, but understand that as something gets hot, it tends to expand, and so the density decreases. If you've got a lot of water vapor in the air, uh, it tends to decrease the density of the air. So hot and humid makes our density go low. A is, remember, the surface area of the wing. So we need a hell of a big wing, right? Our coefficient of lift, again, some experimentally determined thing, we have a factor of a half. So what this tells me is if my mass is constant at takeoff, my density is constant, the area of my wing is constant, coefficient of lift is a constant, I can calculate velocity, that's my salt speed. That is the speed at which the airplane will produce lift and fly. Well, what if we need more? We can increase A. And we do that on the airplane with a thing called a flap. Right, the exaggerated. If you ever go fly commercial, you'll see this. When you come into land or when you take off, the back of the airplane, the back of the wing extends big metal plate out there. It's called a flap. And what that does is it increases the surface area. So it makes A go big. Well, if A goes big, then lifting force has got to go big, right? But it also slows the airplane down. So V has got to go down. And because V scales at a square and A scares uh, geometrically, then you're going to get an exponential drop in velocity for just a small change in area. So if I need more lift, I increase the area. That gives me some lift. I can get up higher where there's less density. I can give the airplane time to accelerate so I can go with more velocity. And now I can make this big giant aircraft fly. If you've never seen a C5 Galaxy up close, I recommend going to an air show and see one. It's a precious machine. 
It's 240, about 245 feet long. And it's got a wingspan of around 260 feet. And from the ground to the top, the tail is 60 feet. So it's a big, big airplane. We can haul a bunch of semi trucks in. That's what it's for. If you see a fighter aircraft, you'll notice fighter aircraft are very small. They have very small wings, very thin wings. They got to go a whole lot faster. Uh, that's what they're built for. <laughs> go really fast, right? So this is a way that we can use fluid dynamics in conjunction with conservation of energy that we've already talked about to solve some real world problems. Again, you know, something like this, you work with an engineer, you know, aerospace engineer of some kind, and they would tell you what a lot of these values are. They tell you what your coefficient of lift is, what your area is. So you might end up working as a physicist on a design of something, and the designer might come back and say, okay, Mr. Physicist, uh, I need an airplane with these dimensions, right? I've got to be able to carry cargo of these dimensions. How big does the wing need to be in order for the aircraft to fly to pick your velocity? And so you'd use exactly this kind of thing. But the point is we got there just from two or three equations. Pretty simple, right? And then this comes out. I like this lecture. I like doing this in person because of this magic trick. Everybody kind of goes, cool, that's cool. All right. So I think that's where I'm going to stop today. Uh, we will pick up with our discussion uh, on Monday. I have posted a homework assignment that will be due next, when I said due next Friday. Uh, that is going to be all for the content of this course. The final exam I will post on the 1st of May, which is our last official day of class. So there will not be a lecture on that day. Uh, I will just post the final exam and I'll give you until I think the 8th. So that's a week. And that's when the final for this class would normally be scheduled. So expect something similar to the second test. Uh, that will have a little bit more complex calculations in it, but you'll have plenty of time to work it. Uh, something that I'll expect you to be scanning things and sending me documentation with your test. Uh, we'll count that as final exam for the class too. Like I said, I hate doing finals. So your final grade in the class will be your uh, three test averages average with the homework average. So effectively, what you're going to have, if you want to start thinking about final grade in this class, because I know you guys like to do that, you can, to make the math easy, treat the homework average as one test, and then just average the grade out over four tests. That's how I'm going to write your final grade. That's how I'm going to evaluate it. Uh, other than that, remember, if you have questions, you have concerns, send me an email, come by my office, we'll talk about it, and I will get you fixed. Other than that, go away, have a good weekend, and we will continue our discussion next week.